Right, thanks so much. Um, a word of warning in advance, today is the day my neighbour has conveniently decided to drill lots of holes in the wall right next to my head. So I'm hoping he's he, he is stopped for lunch and you'll actually hear me um, fully. Um, so I'm going to be providing a brief overview of some of the results based on apl applying diatoms as a tool for reconstructing doglands paleo environments. As highlighted by, by Ben and by Martin, you know, we are in the early stages of synthesizing a lot of this data. I've tried to incorporate some of the results um, from many of my paleo environmental colleagues who are um, accredited at the bottom of this slide. Um, but again, we are looking at provisional data. And I also have to put a disclaimer. I apologize in advance. I have also have lots of diatom diagrams and I'm nowhere, nowhere near as good as creating diatom diagrams as um, Ben is. So they look a little bit rubbish. Um, but in light of the, you know, the, the, the size of the audience, I wanted to, in the first instance, highlight, you know, introduce diatoms. Not, not everybody may be familiar with what these little critters are. Um, so very briefly, these are single-celled um, photosynthesizing algae uh, that are found in almost every aquatic environment, uh, whether you're looking at freshwater lakes or open marine settings. They secrete what's called uh, a, a frustule, a siliceous skeleton, and it's often very well preserved in sedimentary archives particularly mineralogenic archives. So these are things like um, uh, muddy, sandy deposits, not as well preserved in peatlands as we'll um, find out about. They, are, they, they thrive in peatlands, but their preservation is limited over time as that peat gets buried. Um, they are also really useful because they're very distinct. And you can see a few um, images on the uh, uh, right of your, your screen showing the morphological variety in terms of the shape and the, uh, of these little critters. Um, and I think it's also useful to appreciate scale. S to date, we've, uh, you know, especially with Marty's presentation, we were talking about very, very large scale reconstructions. We're going into the micro now, as, as, as similarly with the pollen, with Ben. This is here on the right hand side is a genus Actinophycus, a marine plankton taxa, approximately 100 microns in diameter. Um, and so there are a, a thousand microns in a millimeter. So you line 10 of these little critters up to make up just one millimeter on your, uh, on your ruler, on your desk. So very, very small. The great benefit of diatoms is that they have very specific environmental requirements, which mean that certain taxa will be encountered in certain aquatic settings, whether that be fresh, brackish or marine. If we looked at salinity as an example, we can go into more detail and I'll allude to this in the presentation because we can talk about life form as well. Some taxa live floating within the water. These are planktonic taxa. Others live attached to or within the substrate underlying the water, um, which these are the benthics. And we also get a, a, a bizarre group called the tycoplanktonic taxa that, that sometimes are associated with the benthic realm, but can also be found in the floating in the water column. Now, um, we can then go into further detail with them, especially with the benthic taxa. So these are the ones that attach to or living on the substrate because different species require, prefer different types of um, substrate. There are taxa associated with aquatic plants, such as epiphytes, which are called the epiphytes. We have epipelic taxa. These are the uh, little critters who like um, being um, attached to or living on muds, very, very fine grained sediments. There are also aerophilus taxa. And these are um, taxa that are adapted to being irregularly flooded. So that could be on the margins of a lake or more often than not in the intertidal zone, if we're looking in coastal, set setting, coastal settings. And then there are epipsamic taxa, those often attached to sand grains, which are more common um, in things like riverine settings. So we've seen this diagram quite a few times already in terms of the, uh, the location of many of these cores that were extracted as part of the, um, the project. And we are going to be, I'm going to be focusing on a selection of cores within this area, Ben alluded to as well. Um, and I'm going to try and provide a generalized um, um, summary of the results. There's been a lot of analysis that's been undertaken. And, but I'm just going to um, broadly divide them into two uh, groups. First, I'm going to explain two cores that have been identified as having late glacial freshwater depositional sequences. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the cores that have um, very valuable um, uh, sequences that show a transition from peat deposition um, into the development of more uh, established coastal environments with the transition appearing to be relatively uniform across the area of around about 9,000 years BP. And considering the aim of this project is to understand, uh, you know, Doggerlands and its eventual loss to the advancing, um, um, advancing seas, it's a really um, important part of uh, this project as well.
So if we were to start off with um, the basically a walkthrough time, we're going to start off with the oldest sequence that um, that I have encountered, which contains diatoms and indeed contains other lovely little things um, to contribute to our understanding of the uh, the late glacial um, period um, within Doggerland. And Ben and indeed Martin alluded to L34, and Ben indeed commented on the uh, one section of the sequence. So. Um, one thing that I would like to acknowledge is the uh, outstanding work done by John Whittaker, who, again, Martin highlighted, did a rapid assessment of every single core to give us an, a, an approximate understanding of the overall um, water conditions that prevailed for many of these sequences. And John in, encountered through his initial Ostracon and Boram work that the basal section of this core was um, uh, um, full of uh, freshwater um, um, forams and uh, freshwater ostracons. He uh, also found an, an abundance of um, open um, or estrine taxa uh, within the overlying um, mineralogenics. And in between, we have this um, rel relatively thick one meter peak units, which we are now finding a lot of information about as, as, as this project progresses. And indeed, work is still um, underway. Some provisional radiocarbon dates and a, an, an assessment for diatoms identified a, a relatively discrete um, 30 centimetre section which had diatoms in them. There were none above, none below, and radiocarbon dating provides us with a relatively reliable signal. Now, just this is bearing in mind that Ben's talk was predominantly on the upper section going into the peat. I'm looking a little bit earlier, so we've got slightly older dates. But for at least for the section of um, this, the core in which diatoms were present, we can um, be confident that they, this accumulated between approximately 16,000 and 14,500 cal BP. Um, and if, if accurate, this place, if accurate, this places this um, period of freshwater deposition into the late glacial stadial, which occurred between 17 and a half to 14 and a half. And for those, to give context for those individuals who may not be familiar with this, we are looking at the um, very cold period prior to the onset of um, climatic warming. Um, this is just one of the um, Greenland ice cores and it shows temperature essentially through the oxygen isotope record. So this whole thing here is cold. And then we go into these warmer periods um, subsequently. But the diatom record seems to be focused only on this um, late glacial stadial episode. And the onset of peak deposition um, is currently dated to between or to, to around about 14 and a half thousand. Um, and again, um, some modeling needs to be undertaken on this to give us um, secure understanding, but we're confident with the dates. But this would suggest that the peak deposition then it becomes initiated during the Windermere or bonding, depending on which term you want to use, or GI1, which then suggests that um, within the peat that um, overlies it, we also have the potential to preserve the Younger Dryas and also the Holocene. And this is reinforced by the fact that we have a date of the peat um, into estrine deposition around about 9,000 years BP. So we have a meter sequence that has the potential to span quite a considerable period of Earth's history, a quite important period of Earth's history, um, considering the retreat of ice sheets and indeed our understanding of Doggerland um, as we um, move through the late glacial into the early Holocene. So this is a um, one of the lovely diagrams that I'm sure you're going to um, uh, detest, primarily because they're so small and it makes it very difficult to read half of the little names on them. But uh, as Ben highlighted, it's looking at a, a vertical profile food sedimentary sequence. I've highlighted a couple of the key radiocarbon dates. And indeed, diatoms are restricted to the basal section prior to peak deposition. But just to highlight the interest that we're looking at here now, we've got this, uh, all the work is ongoing uh, due to the delays as we're, we're all familiar with, but we have a potential to have a sequence that could, a peak sequence in fact, you know, this is a, an organic sequence that could shift through the entire um, late glacial into the early Holocene. And it's reinforced by the fact that some of the work that David Smith's highlighted has, um, um, identified a, a small but um, suitably interesting um, beetle signal within a number of the bulk samples that were taken that indicate cl cold climate. So we are relatively confident that we have a uh, conformable sequence and indeed the radiocarbon dates also show conformity throughout. So it's going to be really interesting to hear this develop um, over the coming um, months and indeed next year. So we're going to focus just on this joyous signal down here with some provisional results. Uh, yes, trying to explain a single diagram like this in 20 minutes is difficult enough, and I'm trying to get going to get through three or four of them. 
Um, so again, we highlight the, the, um, the radiocarbon dates. We're looking at the lowermost section about 0.3 meters. The uppermost date infers that we're looking at around about the onset of the Windermere and Stadial here. And the radiocarbon dates allude to this being in the Greenland, Greenland um, Stadial prior to warming. We have a relative abundance of what are known as these tycho, tycho planktonic taxa. And um, through much research, um, uh, th these taxa are often associated with ice cover in Arctic late, um, late glacial sequences. It's reinforced by the fact that there are, all that, well, there are no planktonic taxa, and I'll talk about that um, shortly. There's no planktonic freshwater taxa. The, um, the subordinate um, grouping um, are the, um, uh, the, the benthic taxa. And as, you, as, as highlighted with these little arrows, there is an increase in the tycoplankton, then a decrease through this zone. And the benthic taxa, specifically this um, little critter, Gyrosigma attenuatum, um, decreases and then increases, mirroring the increase and decrease in uh, tycoplankton. And towards the top of the signal, we have this uh, increase in some benthic taxa associated with organic fragments and organic remains. What's really bizarre, uh, is the fact that there is a small but sufficiently significant signal of marine plankton and brackish benthics. Um, they are in low numbers, but they're but in terms of preservation, they look genuine. But this is something that we're going to we will talk about as well. But it's also worth bearing in mind the elevation of this uh, this core depth. The, the top of this section is around about eight minus eighteen point nine meters OD, and we are looking at fourteen fifteen. 16,000 years ago, a long time ago, and quite high elevation. Um, I also want to highlight some of the other work, you know, Ben's alluded to the uh, abundance of dwarf pollen, juniper, uh, uh, you know, um, then there's these, these, these aquatic taxa, the water milfoil and bulrush, some reflection in the plant macros within this section as well, primarily aquatics and marginals. And of greatest interest, and this is how proxy work or uh, proxy analyses always work, there is a relative abundance of ostracods in the section beneath where my diatoms are encountered. And the lowermost sample has um, some, um, David Horn has done some mutual climate temperature reconstructions to infer that the lowermost sample could have winter temperatures of minus 21. And slightly higher up, again, just below my section, winter temp temperatures are still cold, not as cold, but minus 10. So we have very, very cold climatic conditions immediately preceding the section in which diatoms um, so uh, in summary, the most uh, most common datums present are a mixture of these tycoplankton with a, a smaller amount of epiphyton and epelon. There are no freshwater plankton species. Now, the majority of the tycoplanktonic taxa, known as the, uh, in a group of fragilarioids, are most often associated with ice, ice cover. And that's supported further by the presence or, or the absence of plankton. And these fragilarioid species are able to colonize habitats such as the littoral zones of, of lakes that have seasonal ice cover. We're not talking about permanent ice cover, I don't think, because we have all these plants in the, in the, in the close proximity that's being alluded to. Um, and the dominance of such species has been found to be characterized, characteristics of many lake glacial sequences in, in Northern uh, Europe. We then have these shifts between fragil fragilarioid species and other benthics, which are likely a response to the variations in ice cover, seasonality of ice cover, and then which in turn affects nutrient supply and the openness of the water around, it, around these margins. And then we have the climat climatic amelioration due to the onset of the Windermere would result in ice melts and the re-establishment of open water conditions and enabling these other benthic taxa to become more um, typical and especially the uh, abundance of epithemias, these epiphytes that are uh, more often associated with plants immediately prior to the onset of the Windermere interstadial or during the, the, the transition. The presence of a marine brackish taxa must be considered, and I think the most, the, the most likelihood is that we have a taxonomic issue here. We have reworking of older sediments. Um, if we take into account the elevation um, and the likely position of mean sea level, you know, 16,000 years ago, we are some considerable distance away from the likely um, coastline. However, as Martin's alluded to, we are still as of yet fully um, able to understand the extent of crustal movements, of glacial ice static rebounds, um, and understanding the, the more localized geomorphological variations to fully discount other factors. But it's very likely that we will have pre-existing earlier sediments that could have been reworked to provide this small but consistent signal. 
Deep breath. Moving quickly on. L51 is located at the southernmost section of this uh, southern uh, valley that Martin um, provided a summary of. Slightly different stratigraphy, uh, dominated by mineralogenics with an organic rich silt rather than a peat unit. And again, fantastic work by John Whitaker. I highlighted the initial abundance of freshwater uh, conditions, which were then replaced by uh, estuarine conditions, which includes this um, organic silt section. And diatoms were found in abundance throughout the whole two meters. The, um, the lack of organic material prohibited um, AM, uh, uh, radiocarbon dates throughout the sequence. And, and one of the activities we will be doing is working with the OSL results in, in, the, in the longer term from the underlying strata. But one of the dates from towards the top of the freshwater sequence um, it identifies that we are looking at around about 12 and a half thousand um, and from which you could assume, assuming, you know, no um, considerable unconformities, that this material beneath the, uh, that date is going to predate 12 and a half. And that would therefore put us likely in the Windermere, this slightly warmer period. Previously, we were looking at the Greenland Stadial. Now we're looking at this um, slightly warmer, um, um, warmer period. And again, because of the fact that we have radiocarbon dates towards the top of the sequence that allude to late Holocene, we can have the potential that we could have a section that cut spans the Younger Dryas as well as the early Holocene. Another beautiful diagram, and in very brief summary, strats, slight stratigraphic variations in organic content. We, we infer Windermere into stadial for the lowermost section in which the diatoms are most abundant. Uh, we now have some freshwater plankton in low numbers. Freshwater uh, plankton are present, but consistent. We have a much lower um, uh, preservation, uh, presence of tycoplankton. Indeed, these, are, um, these little zones are being exaggerated because they're so, so, so low, so they're very, very small components. We're in this um, assumed Windermere in stadial and vege vegetation thriving diatoms are much more common. Indeed, you can see the overall dominance. We're looking at about 70%. 60-70% of the diatom assemblage, with you know, a, an overall decline in some of the key taxa with height towards this upper zone. And in contrast, we have a low but consistent number of epi epipelic taxa, these are the muddy taxa, but there is an increase, quite a substantial increase, especially with one taxa called um, uh, Cavinula scutelloides, which is a very cryptic one I found very little information about. However, it does increase quite substantially prior to this um, this is a zonal boundary that I've identified. This zonal boundary, however, is due to extremely poor preservation. And if we take this all into account, poor preservation, the, 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 the radiocarbon dates, and this increase in muddy or sand um, dwelling tax, so we could start thinking about what's going on. Overall dominance of aquatics initially, increase in taxa associated with sandy or muddy substrates, um, coinciding with a, a an overlying zone of poor preservation. Could this be an evidence of an unconformity or the uh, indeed the younger dryas? So planktonic taxa are present in very low numbers. Tycoplanktonic flagellarioids are now restricted and it suggests a very shallow freshwater body. The floral assemblage further dif differs to 34 in that now epiphytes and epipelic taxa dominate. The epiphytic taxa dominate uh, but um, um, they dominate in the base, but increase, de decrease in height over time to be replaced by this taxa uh, Cavinula scutelloides, which is uh, associated with sandy and or muddy substrates. And if we can retain confidence as we have with the radiocarbon dates, this then shift into very, very poor preservation with height. We could be looking at actually a climatic signal preserved within the diatoms as well. Um, the transition in and around the Younger Dryas resulting in increased epipelic, epip epipsamic taxa is a result of climatic deterioration, associated loss of aquatic algae, and the increase in erosion of turbidity within a very shallow water setting, making the setting more favourable for species that adhere themselves to mineralogenics. And again, we, just to reinforce this, we then have this much more epiphyte rich sequence underneath, to which we, again, we're going to be working with the um, dating team to get a greater understanding of the, the age of this section, because at the moment we're reliant on a single uh, AMS radiocarbon data at the top. I'm sure Tim will have information about these sequences as we as we continue on with regards to the OSL. We 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 can be confident that we're looking at the Windermere in stadial based on the abundance of epiphytes and a, a assumption that there is a lot of organic um, plants uh, plant uh, living in and around this 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 um, setting. 
right, five minutes ago. I think I'm doing all right. Um, the second aspect, and just as significant, is obviously one of the key drivers um, and, and objectives of this project was to understand the inundation of Doggerland, you know, the, the timing and the extent, the rate, and as it so on and so forth. And one of the best ways of doing that is when we find stratigraphic boundaries of clear freshwater into um, a coastal um, deposition or estuarine deposition. Now, um, a number of the cores had a stratigraphic boundary preserved within, and I'll highlight a couple of them here. Um, I'm only going to um, talk about one and then provide some general uh, comments about the others as well, just in, in due to time. <clears throat> but in general, all of them, all of these cores highlighted here, in which we have this freshwater peat to estuarine silt deposition, had a stratigraphic boundary dated to a pro somewhere between 9.5 and 8.8. .8. Uh, and again, modelling will be done to um, understand the extent and the, the accuracy and reliability of these things and what that tells us about the rate of change um, in due course. In all instances, diatoms were not preserved within the underlying peats. Now they do live in peatland settings, but the or the um, acids within the um, waters often um, um, dissolve the biogenic silica. So they're not always preserved very well in, in, in pure peats, but they were found in, in abundance in the underlying alluvium. And so therefore it's currently assumed uh, that the stratigraphic boundaries relate to marine transgressions and the flooding of the North Sea lowlands in response to global sea level rise in the early Holocene. We've seen this beauty before, uh, Ben alluded to it. Um, again, John did initial rapid assessments and, and we did an initial radiocarbon dating to highlight that in L20, the transition from um, what was, um, oh, so we have, we have assumed till overlain by freshwater deposition inferred by the, uh, the, the microfossil work and then overlain by um, these, these uh, uh, marine estuarine deposits. And uh, this then directed, as, as it did with every core, further fuller analysis where preservation was found to be good. And diatoms were found in abundance within the overlying strata, uh, but not within the freshwater peat. And here we have a very typical uh, diagram of that boundary. We have the radiocarbon date uh, here, we have the peat at the bottom, diatoms not preserved, and we have the, um, the alluvium overlying it. And this is a very generalized summary of the diatoms that were encountered. We have a low but consistent presence of marine plankton. Um, these are typical, tacks are typical of open uh, marine waters and they are present throughout and in general this is a very uh, typical uh, indicator of you know the influence of tides and so on and so forth but they are low, low and consistent, not ma majorly significantly contributing. The majority are benthic taxa um, and indeed throughout many of these cores it was more often than not the benthic taxa dominated and the plankton were uh, you know quite restricted in their preservation. Um, in a number of the cores, I think this is of, of interest in terms of understanding the, the landscape and the changing that took, took place, many of the cores have um, a, a, a few taxa that are in relative abundance immediately above the stratigraphic boundary. And these taxa are um, associated with much lower salinity um, conditions. In this instance, we're looking at Diplonase finica. Uh, that in, in another core, it was Navicula varigula. There are certain um, species that are much more um, associated with lower salinity, salinity conditions encountered in abundance at the stratigraphic boundary and then reducing in height to be replaced by the more typical marine brackish epipelic taxa, those attached to the body substrates and epiphytes. Oh, I'm going to have to run now. Okay. Um, and then in this instance, there's an increase in epiphytic taxa with height. Um, is it working? There we go. So the, um, to generalise, the majority of the cores under analysis all preserve diatom assemblages containing taxa with lower salinity preferences immediately above the assumed freshwater units. And this would support the hypothesis, obviously, that the peat units are freshwater in origin, rather than being a, a small um, a peat body um, accumulating in an in a, in a abandoned tidal uh, um, uh, channel or something similar on the mudflats. Uh, these boundaries are therefore all gradual and also unlikely to be erosive. This is one of the things I think is very important in understanding the role of relative sea level change, because potentially you could have a, a section of the peat being removed um, prior to the marine deposit deposits um, accumulating. But the fact that we have these low salinity uh, preferring species immediately overlying would suggest that we're looking at a, a gradual, however you want to define gradual in terms of timescales, but a conformable shift in climate. And in general, the floral assemblages are uh, dominated by either epipelic or epiphytic, 
And there is an overall absence of these taxa in the aerophilus ray, uh, aerophilus taxa and epipsamic taxa, and generally restricted marine plant plankton. And based on this, we think we're looking at marine brackish tidal settings, likely tidal lagoons or small tidal inlets, rather than a very open um, coastline um, to account for these sort of assemblages being um, present. And just a final slide um, is just in terms of, we are very early in, in this assessment, in this analysis and interpretation. You know, we have variations between these cores. So for example, um, two and 54 are dominated by the epiphytes to suggest a more of a, uh, vegetated um, coastal lowland with things like seagrasses, whereas some of the other cores are more the muddy substrates. And, and this will start helping us uh, when we start putting them into paleogeographical contexts and synthesizing with the other data. You know, I don't think we've got this lovely uniform shift from freshwater to marine conditions as sea level rose. And this is highlighted by simply just trying to plot vertically the transition from freshwater peat into estuarine alluvium. The, the, the elevations don't necessarily link to um, to the timings of the um, the transitions. Some of the cores, um, some of the cores that um, were flooded latest by uh, marine conditions are um, were, are some of the deepest cores. So, as highlighted by Martin, we've got a really complex um, geomorphological um, uh, picture to, to develop first. Are we looking at little isolation basins? Are we looking at an, more of an open setting? You know, what are the crustal movements to, to, to account for these vertical variations and so on? So there's a lot of things to think about. And we are at, at the start of really starting to really synthesize this data together. But it's exciting nonetheless. nonetheless. And in light of um, uh, Richard being in front of me in the screen, I'm going to leave some of the summary um, points up um, for uh, and ask for any questions. Thanks, Tom. That's, that's really great. Um, yeah, so uh, just before questions come in, uh, David uh, Smith has actually commented that in uh, from 34 level that you mentioned, the average summer temperature of 10 degrees and average winter of minus 22. So um, but back onto that. I have, I have a question here on um, whether AI plays any role in your counting of the number of diatoms in samples. Uh, no, that's not something that I've, ever, I've been involved in, I have to admit. 